I want to say a couple of things. <clears throat> I introduce our guest speaker. Um, I've kind of tried to be the you know the, the, the facilitator and the, and the humor and the and the and, and the and the cat herder as we move through this. But there's something very serious that I feel uh, and I'd like to share. And that to me is that I was I was a kid from Beaumont, Texas, and I I, I, I kind of lost the way I pronounced words. I had no idea what a frap was or why th I thought soda was baking soda. And you know, so um, to me, you know, I fell in love with Dartmouth when I did a, a, a trip. My dad took me on. Uh, because I just thought it was the most beautiful uh, place I'd ever seen in my life. And uh, I had gone to uh, all-male uh, boarding school, a jet run by the Jesuits in uh, Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, where I also had to learn how to speak a different language than what I had grown up with. And um, uh, the whole uh, the idea that Dartmouth was all-male uh, didn't bother me at all because that's what I knew and, and that's what I was used to. And I have to confess that having uh, purchased a banner uh, in the co-op, they actually sold this thing. And it said, uh, there was a, you know, there was a Ford commercial back in those days that said, when better cars are built, Ford will build them. This banner said, when better women are made, Dartmouth men will make them. I kind of wondered why it was that I was having a little struggle with the dating and, you know, some of this stuff. And so, you know, I want you to understand that, you know, Dartmouth for me was an uh, amazing opening, uh, wide opening, changing experience. Coming from this, uh, you know, this this Jesuit Catholic background and this obvious distorted view of of, uh, of the the various contributions of the sexes, I, I I confess this to you so that you know that I have uh, three daughters, um, and uh, and one of them when she was four years old uh, was a great soccer player to be and ended up being you know. Stanford and play anyway, so I, I was very upset that she couldn't play on the co-ed team because she was so much better than all the boys when she got to be six. And so being a lawyer, you know, I wrote a letter. So, you know, I really changed in this time period. And the prelude to all of this is that our guest speaker tonight is a woman who uh, was hired by Dartmouth uh, in 1968 as the first uh, a woman hired who was on a tenure track. Um, her name uh, was different. It wasn't Navarro then, and, and I asked her uh, uh, to tell me, uh, remind me what it was, and, and she did, and I still can't pronounce it, but uh, we'll let her talk about that later. But. Um, I met her because I took a class from her, and um, she was probably 30-ish or something, and a young uh, professor, and I was late turning in my paper because I was preoccupied with something and else, and, and so uh, she said, you know, you couldn't text or email, so somehow I communicated with her, probably left a note in her office or whatever the protocol was. And, and, and if I turned in the paper by such and such a time, I could bring it to her home. So um, I, I had been to some professors' homes, and they were pretty nice, you know, they were pretty nice. I, I went to uh, Gene Garthwaite's home, and it was really nice. He had all this Iranian, Persian rugs and all this stuff, and, you know, they made all this. Anyway, so I thought, well, it'll be cool. I'll take it to her home. And, and she was living in a faculty apartment up on the, behind uh, the, the dorms there, you go up the hill across from Alumni Gym, and this little apartment, and her little daughter was there. And I had uh, an, an experience of what it, I had a thought in my head that I took away from that about what a difference it was uh, to be a, a single mom 
uh, teaching in an all-male college with all-male colleagues and all-male students. And I, and I don't know, I developed, a, it was one of those things that just sort of changes you and it was an image and I don't, I don't know exactly what it meant to me at that time, but I think it was the beginning of me starting to see things differently about that. So when Dartmouth became co-ed, I was uh, on, on, the, on, on the team that thought that was a really good thing. And I really, uh, I don't know where that banner is. Fortunately, it doesn't exist. I can't find it anywhere because I'd burn it. But the point is, the point is Dartmouth itself has changed. But what's interesting is this young woman whom I met, who was a great teacher, as everyone that taught us here at Dartmouth, to my memory, was, because I don't think you could survive here if you weren't. Uh, and maybe you didn't even get hired if you weren't. Uh, this young woman really made a tremendous uh, changes, helped make, guide changes here at Dartmouth. She was um, very responsible for Dartmouth still having a geography department, um, and she steered coeducation or helped steer coeducation very courageously in a direction different from where it was originally envisioned, which I think was good for the college. She was um, uh, very important in helping reorganize the economics department. And she did all this as the proportion of men and women on the faculty, uh, she, she denies that she was responsible for that. Anyway, the uh, many of the faculty, uh, you know, it was, the, the number of women on the faculty was growing smallly, shortly, small, you know, not, not hugely. Uh, but she also played roles in, in facilitating that. So uh, I, I say all that because to me, uh, this little kid from Beaumont, Texas that didn't know how to speak very well in terms of, you know, the English language that was spoken in first the Midwest was a challenge and in New England. Um, Dartmouth was always gift. I, I always felt that the, the greatest gift I'd ever been given in my life was the opportunity to learn here under great men and women teachers uh, who really believed in teaching and wanted to open your mind and wanted to challenge you to believe and to think and to reason and to criticize and to be open. And I think um, we had a great forum this afternoon. Some of you were there, some of you were doing other things, which I think is very important that we all get to do things differently because we all need different things in our life. But Wallace uh, Ford led this panel, and uh, some things came out in that panel that were really powerful. And uh, everybody takes away something different. But I think that Dartmouth is, as gift is a way of thinking, not only about ourself in terms of, of our life and what it's meant to us, but it's also maybe a way of thinking about teaching as a profession and um, the commitment to it. And so I, I just, I'm gonna just stop talking and, and, and if my iPhone comes back up, I'm gonna, I, yeah, there we go. Uh, I, I wanna introduce Marissa, but I also wanna introduce a man who had a profound impact on me and the way I think. And that's uh, Dr. Gene Garthwaite. And I just want him to stand up and, uh, he's, he's the Jane and Raphael Bernstein, I hope I pronounced that right, Professor of Asian Studies Emeritus at Dartmouth, and he taught here from 1968 to 2011. So Gene, uh, Gene is one of the most respected, he's, he's one of the most respected historians of, of the Middle East, and, 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 and they, they call that East Asia or something, but he's an expert on Iran and on, on Persia. And, um, and he, teach, he taught in a very, a very a way that helped you understand the culture and the people, and I, I call it an anthropological economic approach to history. And of course, uh, we have our guest speaker, and she is, uh, was the uh, when she was at Dartmouth, and so she still is the Charles and you see the Collis thing, the Charles and a Freed Collis Professor of History Emerita. 
So, so that's really important. You know, the Emeritus and the Emerita, you know, if you know the Latin, all right? And she taught at Dartmouth from 1968 to 2010. But as she will tell you, she is far from retired. She's now down at Harvard, uh, and I'm just not gonna say anything else because she will speak for herself, believe me. Marissa Navarro. Thank you, Tex. Thank you, everybody, for accepting Tex's idea that I should come and spend some time with you and tell you something about your life at Dartmouth and my life at Dartmouth. Um, I just wanted to say that in the preparations, is that? In the preparations, he was very careful to send me um, a long list of possible topics that I could cover tonight. Actually, the list had 30 items. <laughs> and to me, the list, as I began to read them, was very extraordinary, and I will mention only five so that you get an idea of his imagination. They went from being the only female professor at a college where all the students were men, which is not exactly true, as I will explain later, to my proudest moments and greatest disappointments and regrets. How do you like them apples? Quite a lot of those. To what is Dartmouth's future? I wish I could begin to think about that. And to another, two other items, advice as we enter our 70s. That's all of you, by the way, he's talking about. And he needed, he asked me to share my experiences, my goals, and my attitudes. I am the model that you're supposed to follow. And to finally tell us your life story. <laughs> and your philosophy of life. How needless to say, there's no way I can begin to tackle even these five items that I'm describing to you, much less the, 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 the 25 others that I have left without mentioning. So um, I get ready to be disappointed. I will only obey text on one item, which is not to, to try not to be too lengthy and not to speak for too, for too long. So I will begin by saying that um, trying to right the wrong about the, 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 that fact. Um, there were a few t women teaching at, at, uh, before I came to Dartmouth, but they were all, they, they were not here like men. The men were here. They were not in the ranks. They were adjuncts. They were perfectly prepared and capable of doing their job. But because they were married, in many cases, to Dartmouth professors, they could not teach at Dartmouth. And because they were women, also, they could not teach at Dartmouth in the ranks. That was what existed at least until 1968. Um, Buried in uh, Texas questions, there was one which states how and why Dartmouth. And he doesn't pose it as a question. It's a statement, as if my appointment had been the most natural, normal thing in the world. And the issue is that it was not normal. I still don't know today how on earth I came to Dartmouth. There is no rational explanation for me to give you for my, uh, the appointment I, I received. Um, I came to Dartmouth in 1968, and my only answer to this 
non-question of text, is that I was lucky. And the stars were aligned in the right way, and that's why I came. It's a series of coincidences that I could not have imagined, but helped my coming to, to Dartmouth. Not any other reason, I can't see any other. Um, the year before I came to Dartmouth, the department lost a very good historian, Ernie Young, because it would not hire his wife, Marilyn Young. Both of them had gotten PhDs in history from Harvard University. He had an appointment, but she didn't. And there was an opening in um, foreign policy, in uh, US foreign policy, and they would not even consider her uh, for an appointment in the department. He, Ernie, got very angry, and he sought a job elsewhere. And the University of Michigan was happy enough to offer him a position and offer his wife a position. Therefore, the history department, a year before I came, lost a very good historian because it did not wish to hire a very good woman historian. So I think that it shook the members of the department a little bit. In particular, the, the younger sectors of the department, which was growing at that time. That same year, that same year, the person who taught Latin American history uh, 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 was uh, Peter Smith, and Peter Smith decided to move to Wisconsin. Peter Smith was a classmate of mine at Columbia University. We were in different years in the PhD program, but I knew him from Columbia. So therefore, when um, he needed, the department needed to make a replacement, he was asked by Lou Morton, who was the head of the department, uh, if he knew anybody, uh, and uh, um, he said he, he didn't mention me. However, at the same time that all this was happening in Hanover, I was in New York, living in New York, teaching in New Jersey, in a small college in New Jersey, and I was going to a seminar at NYU, uh, the seminar headed by Conor Cruz O'Brien, a very important Irish intellectual, and one of the members of the seminar was a Dartmouth historian named jo Jonathan Mursky. So therefore, I, we were colleagues in the seminar. When he heard that Peter Smith was going, he said, I know somebody who could take that job. And he mentioned it to me, he mentioned it to Lou, and how I became a candidate for the position because I knew Jonathan Mursky, and I knew Peter Smith, and there had been, uh, uh, the department had had a, a semi-general heart attack because of uh, losing Ernie Young. Then, 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 um, there was another element. Lou, uh, Lou Morton, the chair of the department, had a very dear friend in, uh, in, 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 at Dartmouth who was no longer there. He had moved to New York. His name was Kalman Silvert. I don't know if anybody took classes with him, but he was a political scientist who, who taught Latin America and he used to come back to Dartmouth quite frequently. So Lou Morton called Kalman Silbert, who would be then headed, he, 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 after going to NYU, he went to the Ford Foundation and headed Ford Foundation Latin America. Well, he called uh, Kalman Silver, and Kalman Silver said, Marisa Navarro, Marisa Giras, yes, I know her. Where did he know me? He know me from Argentina. The year I spent doing research for my dissertation, I spent speaking at least once a week with him. 
because I did not get along with my, histo my, my professor historian at, the, at Columbia University. And I got along very well with this political scientist who thought that my thesis was a wonderful subject. So therefore, I, we became friends. He approved, he helped me. He became my mentor in that year. And Lou Morton was therefore very happy with the answer that Galman Silver gave him. So therefore, I all of a sudden found myself with an, a request to send my Vita, which I did, and I received an invitation to go to Dartmouth, and uh, I sent it. I, 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 uh, I went to Dartmouth, I gave a talk, and the job was mine. That was, that, 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 it was luck, wasn't it? Because under normal circumstances, nobody would, would, would have looked at me. Under normal circumstances, what would have happened is that Lou Morton would have called somebody at Harvard or Columbia and would have asked, so and so, um, do you have a boy ready to come to teach a course? That was the old boys network. That's how men got jobs at that time. And that's where the women did not get jobs, in particular if they, were, they, they had problems with their professors. And, and many women did have problems with their professors. And I had problems with my professor uh, at Columbia because he had the nerve to say to me, are you sure you want to write a thesis? And I said, yes, I am. Are you sure you should not go home to take care of your husband and your child? And I said, no, I am sure that I want to write a thesis. And so therefore, I went away. And I'm not the only one, I'm, I'm, I'm having met many other uh, colleagues. In any case, um, I, w I need to explain an additional thing about these, these circumstances. Um, I, besides getting the job at Dartmouth, I got a fellowship that I had applied for six months before from the Social Science Research Council. I wanted to do research in Brazil, and I got the fellowship. So I got the same day that I got the, job, the Dartmouth offer, I got the announcement that I had a fellowship to go to Brazil. So I said, and I was having a very hard time my husband had left me. I had a seven-year-old child. I couldn't pay my, my rent in New York. Um, and uh, I was sure that I was going to take the Dartmouth job, but I, was sure, I wasn't sure that they're going to wait for me if I took my fellowship, which I also wanted to take. So Lou Morton said, go to Brazil, get your fellowship, come back, the job will wait for you. So that was very nice, I must say. On the other hand, I got very angry as well. Why? Because in the small New Jersey college that I taught in, I had tenure and I was an, an associate professor. I had made a social professor very rapidly. I had a book out and I had two articles out and I had another article ready to go. And Dartmouth only offered me an assistant professorship. I had to go back down in the ranks and it offered me that because I was a woman. I got very angry, but I didn't say a thing because I knew that Dartmouth was a better place than the place I had in New Jersey. It was also a better place to bring up my child. It was, a better play, it was a better job all around. I swallowed my pride and my anger and I stayed. I decided to come. I went to Brazil and came to Dartmouth and it was the right decision and I never, never regretted it, regretted making that decision despite the fact that it took me a while to get over it because I'm a stubborn person and it takes a while for me to get, get rid of the angers I have. In any case, um, this, this, is, this is how I came. And I came to the best department 
that I could have chosen to come. The history department was a very special place. We had a very savvy, wise, old, uh, not so old, but pretty much older than we were, um, wise but very wise man who was our, the chair of our department. We used to call him the Godfather. That's when the What's His Name movie came out, and he looked like a, an Italian, though he was Jewish, but he looked like a, a Godfather. And he treated us as his children to be to be coaxed and put in the right places for the department to really do what he wanted the department to do at Dartmouth College. Um, it was a, a, a pretty young department. Recently, the, 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 it had been, uh, all the, the, the older generation had uh, go, was gone, and there were all sorts of new people uh, in, in, in the associate ranks, and there were a, a group, there was a group of very young people. Jean Garthwaite had just arrived. I don't know, some people may have had uh, Leo Spitzer, uh, Pete Slater, um, who else? Um, Leo Li, Leo Li in Chinese, and then I, I joined the group. Um, th we had a wonderful secretary, a marvelous lady who sat as a child on the knees of uh, Teddy Roosevelt as she told us many times, and sang the whole time in Reed Hall. Reed Hall was our, our, our palace. Um, and she, she had the, ta the ability to speak uh, and have long conversations with my mother when my mother came to visit. My mother spoke Spanish and not a single word of English. And Mrs. Pete spoke English, not a single word of Spanish, but they loved each other and they embraced each other. And, and, and we had lots of picnics in which they sat next to one another. And I don't know to this day what they talked about. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that was, and Miss, 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 uh, 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 Mrs. Pete also had the good sense of training one of the best uh, employees of, 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 of Dartmouth College, and that's Gail Patton, who is uh, an absolutely uh, fantastic administrative assistant and the, the memory of the department and the anchor of the department. So, and she's been with us since she was 18, I think, and she's like pretty good. soon she's going to be 62. So she's been there always, and 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 will be there for a long time, hopefully. Um, now, and in terms of detail, for my, ch for my child, Mrs. Pete would answer the telephone when I was in a departmental meeting and didn't have to ask me in order to tell my daughter that she needed to go home or to come and sit in the lounge waiting for me. She gave the orders. And my daughter obeyed, and I was, it was fine. Whatever Mrs. Pete said was okay. Uh, whenever Jean Garthwaite took his three boys uh, fishing, he would always invite my daughter to go fishing. She learned skating because he took his children skating and my daughter skating. And because they, she couldn't expect that from me because I don't skate, I didn't skate, I, don't, I still don't skate. So therefore, there's, and, and, and skiing as well. She learned how to ski with your children. All, there was an, an, a, a willingness in the members of the department who received me in ways that I cannot, I, I only describe in, in, in these little act, acts which were very meaningful to me and very important in my life and the life of my child. That's for your consolation, Tex. Um, we also worked, all of us, the department at that time until I would say in the late 80s was the best department in the college. And uh, there is agreement in, in, in among many, many other people in other departments. We worked very hard, but we also had a very good time. Um, 
we had a wonderful lounge. The students gravitated to it. They went to the, to the, to the student center. This did not exist. Um, and they always went by Reed Hall and they would uh, sit down in the lounge. They would read the New York Times. Some of them got into the habit of coming and talking to every, whoever was in the lounge and they were there for hours. Therefore, the kind of interaction with the student body, which is quintessential at Dartmouth College, was very intense, at least in Reed Hall. And, and we were all very much involved in it, something that doesn't happen as much to, to the, in uh, these days. Um, however, when I arrived, I also thought that not, I would not stay here very long. It was such a small place, such a provincial place. It felt very small, cozy, but terribly asleep. And I was so wrong, so wrong. Because in fact, Dartmouth had woken up and I didn't know it. Uh, I had not followed what, what happened in Hanover and uh, uh, because there was no reason for me to, to, to worry myself about a male institution which was never going to hire me. So therefore, I did not know what had happened, but I learned very soon. Um, the, the institution had begun to change in pretty, in pretty important ways, reflecting or accompanying the, the changes that were taking place in the country as a whole. Um, in the country in what, which was uh, concerned about the civil, the, 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 the civil rights movement, the growing opposition to the war in Vietnam, the women's struggle beginning of, the, of the, the women's movement to redefine the role of women in society, of which I felt very much part of. Even before I came to Hanover, living in New York, it was impossible not to be, not to be aware of what was going on or to be involved in what was going on. And, um, and also, pretty soon, the, con the conversations about co-education uh, as, pa as part of what was happening in many other institutions and perhaps ought to happen at Dartmouth as well. Um, shortly after I arrived, I heard about the scandal of the 1968 graduation in which a student, the valedictorian, um, instead of doing the traditional speech, made a political speech. And in the middle of his address said, if they come to your house and ask you to, and tell you that your number is up, do not go to Vietnam. And that was the beginning of hell. All of it went loose. All of it went loose. The, there was a very strong reaction on the part of President Dickey. There was a strong reaction on the part of the alums. Uh, and, and the students reacted as well on both sides of the position. Um, in, 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 in this was a, a very, a very, and there were, of course, guests who, and we were, we were I, were, I wasn't part of it, but that the institution was, uh, was very upset to have had such a behavior uh, uh, in front of our guests. In fact, when the same year that there had been the takeover of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Columbia University and there, that we were becoming like the other, the scandals of other places. Um, the other thing that was happening in the college and uh, which I began to see very soon was the issue of ROTC, which was again connected with the, uh, with the, uh, the, 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 the opposition to the war in Vietnam. Uh, there was a very small SDS group on campus, and um, but then there was an and there was, there was another issue, and uh, and that was the role of the blacks uh, in this institution and in, in in society at large. And pretty soon, Wally Ford, whom I regret not to have seen uh, this afternoon, I, you could see Wally Ford strutting 
on campus with his hands in the back. He was my student. He was in class with me. I knew him very well. I could say those things to him, about him. And he, with an afro this big at that time, dressed in fatigues. And my most delicious memory of him is him in the in, in uh, um, alumni hall, sitting in front of a big table with other students uh, that would that were the leaders of the Afro-Am at that uh, 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 movement at that moment, uh, speaking to the faculty and to President Kemeny, who was sitting uh, 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 on, 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 the, on the side, and he smoking a big cigar like Fidel Castro, and, 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 and getting what, in fact, they had come to negotiate. But these were the times where things were topsy-turvy. And those who were not here heard the echoes of what was happening here. And I think we are very upset, much more upset than we were about what happened, uh, what happened in Hanover. In any case, uh, the, the, greater, the, the, the greatest event uh, shortly after was at the takeover of Parkhurst by the students uh, in 1968. And uh, Gartwright and I, and Leo Spitzer, and Michael Hershenson, and many other faculty spent the night in front of Parkhurst, which had on top of, on top of the building a, ba a flag with the face of Che Guevara, waiting for the National Guard to come and dislodge them and put them in, in buses. And we did not want the students to suffer, nor violence to be done on one side and the other. And we waited for them until they went, all went home. I put my daughter to bed, and I joined all the boys, and I spent the night there. It was, it was upsetting, it was hard, and I think the students valued that faculty was there. And on the other hand, it was something that should not have happened, but did happen as it was happening in many other institutions. Um, that, as a result of that, of those events, students were uh, tried here by the, administ by the administration. Some of us defended students. Um, on the other hand, they were also, uh, they spent some time in jail and they were the only students who were involved in campus takeovers who went to jail, um, uh, uh, and twice, because they, they, uh, uh, they were punished, they, not, not to jail twice, they were punished twice, they were punished by the college, and they were punished by society. Um, and that summer, what, what I had a little red, red Volkswagen, I had seven students in jail. And that summer, I spent the summer uh, doing homework and going to the different jails and taking them homework so that they would study and they would be ready to take their exams when they came out so that they didn't miss the, 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 the school year because that's not what they wanted, we wanted, and, and, and the institution did not want them to happen. So therefore, this is this was this was this was my welcome to Dartmouth. So after that, I was ready for everything. Um, the irony—I have just to say two two words about the irony and the sadness about all that—is that the disruption of of, of Dartmouth and many other campuses um, happened during the last years of President Dickey. Dickey's presidency. Um, you remember he was president from 1945 until 1970. Um, and because of his, the dedication of his life to internationalism, um, and for he, after, since his years in the State Department and during his life, uh, his, his long presidency at Dartmouth, 
somehow he didn't deserve that, his, his, his work, his commitment, his activities, his life should end that way. However, this is how it ended. Uh, how, how it ended. Um, long before international studies became important and anybody decided that they are, and every institution should be committed to international studies, he told Dartmouth students in 1946 something that in, was instilled in generations of students. The, the, the world's troubles are your troubles. And there is nothing wrong with the world that better human beings cannot fix. He believed that liberal arts, liberating arts as he called them, transformed the individuals, made individuals better human beings. And, 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 uh, and, they, and, and, and this transformation would help to improve the world. He came out of the Second World War, committed to the United Nations. He did something extraordinary then, um, which I and will mention in a second. But at Dartmouth, what he did to translate this international commitment with, as you all know, was to create the great issues which uh, 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 affected uh, uh, generations of students and he also did uh, the William Jewett Tucker Foundation um, for students to get involved in social activism. So he pushed the students to get involved in the world in which they lived. He told them every year when he welcomed them, and he told them every year go and get involved when he said goodbye to them. And unfortunately, it got messed up in his last years. Um, but, but, but I think he should never, he would, I don't think he regretted any of that. And we, he, we should not regret at all what he did. Um, as a feminist, I am particularly thankful to, uh, to what he did when he was in the State Department and he worked in the creating, in the creation of the UN Charter, when he insisted by himself greatly that it would be important to include civil society in the United Nations, that the United Nations was not a place for governments only. It was a place also for normal citizens, for people and all the, all the organizations that they created. And these organizations are non-governmental organizations. We now call them NGOs. And at that time, in 1945, he didn't call them NGOs, but that's what they are. And I have to tell you that there's nothing more beautiful than seeing 30,000 women representing NGOs in China in, 19, for, in 1995 in Waidu when at the UN meeting uh, uh, in, 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 in Beijing and Waidu. And that was done as a result of President Dickey's insistence on the participation of human beings and the transformation of human beings in their, in their, uh, 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 in their act, by their actions. So, if the Dickey years produced enormous changes, and very important changes in Dartmouth, from the curriculum to the acceptance of social activism, though regretted might it be at times, the abolition of parietals to the disappearance of properly dressed young ladies and properly dressed young men on weekends, not the rest of the week, because you all had dates that you brought to the campus and they were properly dressed and so were you properly dressed. They disappeared um, uh, little by little and so did the Kemeny years bring very many changes, but mostly on, because of two issues. One was the Dartmouth Indian symbol and Kemeny's promise 
to rededicate Dartmouth to the education of Native Americans, which this institution was founded to do and had never done properly. Uh, and it's a task that I had the pleasure to work on with Jim Wright when he was, uh, shortly after he came to Dartmouth and he, he, he was teaching a course on cowboys and Indians, but he was talking about Indians, Indians. And so therefore, he also had a great support among the few Native Americans who came, who were at Dartmouth here. And so with some, uh, it was a small group that ended up creating, uh, and, uh, uh, seeing, creating the vision uh, that, that Kemeny had to create a program for and to bring Native American students uh, to Dartmouth. Um, and the other, and, 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 and far very much more important because, because it affected not per se, but because it affected many other people was of course the issue of, of co-education. It was a, na a national issue by the 60s. Uh, Princeton uh, and Yale uh, had gone co-ed by 69, and Pembroke and Brown had merged by 1971. And Cornell uh, had, had uh, went co-ed in 1970. We were there, yes or no. We do it or we don't do it. The conversation had begun institutionally in the 50s, actually. But in 1950, Dickey was asked what he thought of co-education. And he said, I have thought about it seriously but I have great misgivings about its practicality and viability. By 1961, however, things had begun to, ch to change. In 1965, uh, there was a poll taken. The students were split half and half. The faculty was 71% in support of co-education, um, but only 28% of the alumni consulted very, uh, 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 were my, mildly in favor of co-education. I just feel very badly, very bad to be mean to the, alum, to the alums on co-education issues after hearing how generous you've been. You, you, uh, well, you're the one who talked about the fact, how, how this class has been so generous. Well, you know, you've changed. So therefore, <laughs> times change. Therefore, one thing has nothing to do with the other. But I do, I, want, I, I just wanted to mention it, that it bothered me a little bit. Um, but that's history, so therefore we put it there and accept how things are. Um, in 1969, um, Dartmouth entered in a, 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 an exchange program with 13 colleges and which allowed 70 women to take classes for one year, but not give them any degrees. In 1970, another poll was taken, and only 50% of alumni consulted said women could, could be educated at Dartmouth, but they would not agree on whether the exchange program should continue or build a sister school across the river Oh, that, that would be absolutely lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, whether to build a sister school across the river or bring them all on, on, on the campus. Um, the board created a trustee committee on co-education and shortly after being appointed, 19, in 1970, Kemeny created a committee, however, a committee to, on year-round operation. That was his idea, that was his genius uh, uh, solution to allow economically to have a year-round uh, a college that could function and include women in the, uh, in the programs. Um, It was voted by the faculty. The, the faculty 
had to take a vote which uh, went to the board, which admitted, accepted uh, year-round operation, and therefore admitted women at Dartmouth, but um, it also, I, what I, I have to say it, I put in a motion on the floor to modify the motion that we were supposed to, to vote on, and I, I urged the, uh, the, the institution to bring the women on campus and not have them, ha not build a college across the river and, uh, and, and just bring the women, allow them to register and to come to Dartmouth and be like regular students. The motion won, the, won uh, uh, on, on the faculty. This was something that needed to be done because we were supposed to, uh, uh, to take the, 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 uh, the motion to the Board of Trustees, which was then to decide whether or not to go to adopt co-education. I thought President Kemeny was going to kill me, but he didn't. He was very angry because he had found the solution for what he thought was the problem, the economic problem, which he, which he had. And he also had a problem which was that he could be having solved uh, with the year-round year operation. It meant that he could, he could convince the members of the board and the, uh, the members of the, uh, of, uh, of the alumni, uh, he could, they could be convinced that it was going to be all right. Dartmouth was not, not going to disappear and it was not going to be ruined. And the problem, Dartmouth was going through difficult economic problems at that moment. And it was, it needed to change, it needed to include women, but it could not build dormitories, it could not do the things that it should have done or it should accompany a decision to change the, uh, the composition of the student body. So it happened. And in September, on November 71, the board voted to admit women as, a degree, as degree candidates in September 72. And so from, from, from November 71 to September 72, they had to prepare for the, 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 uh, the, 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 the coming of the women. There had been a number of women who had come in the college exchanges, which had continued. They were not stopped, but it was irregular. And a number of women who had come as part of the exchange decided to register and become regular Dartmouth students and they were accepted. Um, we had, the in the, the first class of 76, had 176 freshman women, 125 exchange students who were women, and 77 transfers. The ratio was eight men to one woman. This was a dismal number, which we saw very soon after. And it continued to be that way, um, although in less, in, 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 in the, the ratios began to change gradually, but not fundamentally until 1981. And this was very bad, and it made the process of accepting women even more drawn more painful than it had been until then. The, 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 what, it made the women um, be very involved, uh, little by little, whoever they were, into wanting what they shouted on every occasion, open admission, admit men and women. You don't care, there's no quota at Dartmouth College, and that's what happened in 1981. But that transition was very hard. It was very hard, um, though 
the uh, support of Kemeny for coeducation was clear and firm and unwavering despite the opposition of part of the board and a large number of vociferous and cantankerous alumni who seem to have never produced daughters and not worried about their daughters who would come to Dartmouth. Only men they produce, it appears. In any case, um, the students were in their large majority very supportive of coeducation. Um, and once the decision was adopted, however, I don't believe that preparations were adequate for the, adequate for the, the presence of women. Um, there was, their small numbers seems to have awakened the anger in all those students who shared the alumni opposition to coeducation. They harassed women, they insulted them, they went through hell not in class, but the rest of the day. They attacked them in their dormitories, ridiculed them, used foul language to refer to them, and there's no need to go over the harm story. I know, I'm sure you all know it, and, and which was really serious because it included the dean of the college, and that was in 1975. So, they had been there since 72, three, four, and five. They were going through hell. Um, Dartmouth women had to adapt to a situation which only formally wanted them. The alma mater could not be changed. We still had to sing men of Dartmouth. There were women, but you had to sing men of Dartmouth. I spent the first years of co-education, sitting down on the days uh, without singing men and Dartmouth until, until the words were changed. There was consensus that it would change. It was, we understood that men would suffer, that we would, they would miss having the, cha the, song cha the song changed, but they were women. And if they were going to be part of this institution and made to feel part of this institution, we had to talk, we had to sing about men of Dartmouth and we had to sing about women of Dartmouth. And they were different songs and, different, and they were the same song. We just changed the gender, which was not difficult and it was done, but it took a very long time. Um, what else? That, that, irritated everybody. Um, they had, they, uh, they, they, they made, they punished Dartmouth women. They didn't date them. They brought in dates because they refused to date Dartmouth women. They said like, it was like dating your sister, which was a contradiction because they didn't treat their sisters with harassment and insults. But nevertheless, that was the excuse. This is, if you talk to young women, that's what they complained about. Made their life miserable, social life miserable. Um, and, uh, they, they was, and they also discriminated against them in sports, in the clique club, in all sorts of the, the activities that made up the everyday life of the institution. The women of Dartmouth, the first generation of women of Dartmouth, put up with the aggressions and fought back. they demanding acceptance, respect, and an end to the quota system, which they got in 1981. So they, they made themselves really part of this community, and they never really accepted what what was done to them at the beginning. And what did I do all these years? Well, Dean White Lar asked me to be the first woman associate dean for the social sciences between 85 and 89. And that's something, that's when I did something that I'm very proud of. And that is that I transformed the economics department, although Jean Garthwaite is the one who keeps repeating it because the economics department was a very conservative department 
I was not viewed as a conservative, far from it. And there we had had confrontations with uh, economists in the department, and I had had confrontation on the strike, um, on, uh, on, on the, the great strike uh, uh, in the co-op. And uh, nevertheless, they had, a heart, and they had a heart attack when I became a dean. They had to deal with me. And the first thing that I did was to go to them and ask, all right, what's going on? What is it that you need? What can I do for you? What is, what, what, how come you're so dejected, constantly complaining? So I got a, a list longer than that of text, longer. And I decided to get a person among them, say, you choose a chair, I'll work with him, and we'll do what you need to be doing, which is what other economics departments all over the country do, so that they kill each other, but they get the candidates that they want. And that's what they wanted, to be the first out in order to get the candidates for position. I got it. The dean agreed with me. It worked. And and, 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 the, and the department is now one of the best departments in the college. So I'm really pleased and because I did, although I may not agree with their economic ideas, it doesn't matter. They're my colleagues and I did as a dean what my duty was, told me to do. And they appreciated and Al Gussman is my friend for life, isn't he? Yes. Now. I also saved the geography department, which disappeared from all the colleges in the, in the Ivy. The, Ivy. the geography, I don't understand why geography needed to disappear when it is so important to history and other disciplines, and they are doing, they are thriving, the, continue, the discipline has changed. You do not find too many geography departments in many colleges right now, many institutions. But we have a very good one. Um, and I taught happily an endless quantity of courses alone and with colleagues. <coughs> in 1992, I was made Charles College Professor of History. And that same year, um, I was declared an illustrious visitor of the city of Buenos Aires. In, 19, in 2008, I taught an unforgettable seminar with Professor Garthwaite. It was the last course that I taught at Dartmouth. Um, it was a course on the transformation. We had been talking about this for 40 years. And it was about the transformation of the OSS into the CIA and the first uh, um, the first coups that, that were carried out uh, right after the creation of the CIA. One was in Iran uh, with the demise of uh, Mossadegh and the other one was the coup in Guatemala in 1954. He is an expert on Iran. I work on Latin America and we used, we used uh, the, uh, um, the recently declassified archive uh, sources, uh, from the archive, the materials from these two uh, uh, coups, um, uh, which were in the National Archives. And we had a former student of mine, one of my favorite students, who, was, who worked for the CIA for 20 years, and she came and talked to the seminar about what is to work for the CIA, and uh, uh, um, in, 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 in conversation that she could have, of course. Um, uh, she, and, and we had a newspaper man who had, ri had written the classic materials on the Iran, uh, on the Iran coup, and on the Guatemala coup, and on the, on the, on the, uh, the head of the CIA, and the Secretary of State, his brother. So we were, it was a wonderful seminar. And, and, and it was my swan song um, at Dartmouth College. Um, since then, oh, I want to say that I continue to be very active in feminist causes. 
I belong to uh, I, 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 I belong to NGOs we work, which work for women in this country and following Dickey internationally. Um, I worked for women uh, in Latin America. I've, I've, I've published nine books. I have published close to 60 articles. Um, I, and I would not have been either uh, an, an, uh, 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 a, 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 an associate professor, nor a full professor, nor a chair, nor given a chair, if I had not published, because the demand of publications at Dartmouth have always been pretty, pretty steep. And uh, you needed to be able to teach like nobody else, but you also needed to be able to publish like nobody else. They, that, that, those were the criteria that, that you needed to, to have. Um, I founded the Women's Caucus, which included the librarians, and there were some wonderful people, in the, women in the library. I, I, um, I, there was a year, two years, in which, two years, in which I was on eight committees because everybody wanted a woman all of a sudden on the committee. I needed to represent the woman's voice. I said, no voice, no woman's voice. It's only my voice. And, but I, need, I needed to be in the committee, uh, in the committees. Um, they, uh, I was on the COP, the Committee on Organization and Policy, which is very important. And while being a member of that committee, I wrote a letter and denounced, or rather requ required an explanation for the absence or the, uh, the, the small number of women teaching at Dartmouth College. I was given an answer. Uh, this is worth creating a, an ad hoc committee, which you will chair. I was an assistant professor. That was my fourth year at Dartmouth. Um, it was me, another woman who was an adjunct professor, and the wife of the chair of the French department, and the other members of the committee were six men, including the chair of my department, and we were supposed to write a report as to why there were no more women, there were more, not more women at Dartmouth, and what to do in order to get more women at Dartmouth. So um, we came to the floor of the faculty with 12 recommendations. 11 were accepted. Uh, and the 12th was rejected. And five years later, the federal government uh, compelled, uh, uh, made it possible for us to have the 12th recommendation accepted. The 12th recommendation was a daycare center for the women who taught at Dartmouth and who needed a place to have their children uh, in, well taken care of while they taught. Uh, we got it. So, and it meant targets of more women, change in recruitments of faculty, follow certain procedures, don't call, not the old boys network any longer, but certain rules that needed to be followed so that we could get, make sure that we had women as well as men candidates in all the positions. More bureaucracy, it is very true, but indeed things began to change and women began to be hired. There was a large turnover in the faculty because they may, women may have been hired, but they were not kept and they were not like the women students, they were not in departments that, were, that welcomed them all the time. So therefore, it was also difficult for them. But as generations changed uh, and went by, I think that it took a while. But by the 1980s, we had the largest number of, um, of women in the ranks in the Ivies, and also the largest number of women uh, in, uh, in um, uh, with tenure in, in, in the Ivy. So the, 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 the sooner or later, 
hollering and kicking, Dartmouth responded and did what needed to be done. Um, of all the things that I've done at Dartmouth, one of the most important one has been the pleasure, unending pleasure of being in class. I have loved all the hours I have spent teaching. I, I have a, a, a style which is, 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 uh, which is conversational. I put ideas forth. Sometimes they are half-baked. I'm not sure exactly uh, what I, where I'm going. But, and I want, to be, uh, uh, I want to be debated by the students, and we converse, we think together, and, and, and nothing, nothing is sacred. And nothing, there is no true, there is no, uh, 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 no one speaks ex cathedra. Everybody, is the same. They have the right to question me, but they better know what they're going to do. And I, the only thing that I'm going to do is to ask them the question, that I'm going to find answers which are not facile, which are complex, which shows them where you begin, how you go, what you do in the way, and what happens while you think and where you want to end up. And you then begin to think about the process. Critical thinking, critical reading has been my motto. And I'm not, I, 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 I would not change, I'm very old now, and I would not change now for anything in the world. And I would not change Dartmouth as a teaching place. And all the years that I've been here teaching, for any other place. And I thank you for the opportunity of telling you how lucky you have been and what a pleasure it has been for me to speak to you tonight. And thank you. And if you have questions, if you have questions, thank you. Thank you. I'm willing to answer questions if you have any. Yeah, we're gonna, we're, we have about four or five questions that we have time for, so if, if, if you know, we'll, but that's about Or complaints, it. or complaints, or whatever. Yeah, or, or yes. First question. Yes. yes. We don't have a, I don't think we have, do we have a roving? Yeah, just shout out. Shout out. Yeah. Oh, he's gonna come up, okay, that's fine. That's okay. So everybody can hear and she can too. Tell us about your lovely child that you were so oh. diligent about who must be a little bit older now. She, her name is Nina and she's a professor of Latin American literature at Tufts University. She uh, has two children, Nico who's 17 and is uh, uh, is, is, is a, a in Rinchen Latin in Cambridge and is going to be the captain of the varsity soccer team next year, who likes, who gets history, in history classes, he gets, uh, um, what, what, what does he get? The, the highest grade, the A. the A plus. He gets A plus, and he, he also, but he also likes uh, constitutional law, and I have, a, 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 an 11 year old granddaughter who is a pistol. She's going to be a brilliant designer of, of houses and, 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 uh, and, uh, and cities. She has an imagination beyond whatever I, 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 I can think of. Um, we live in a place in, 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 uh, in Cambridge, in a house which is a, of two, 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 uh, two, uh, two apartments. They live above me. I live down in the ground floor. My grandson and my granddaughter give me a kiss 
every morning before they go to class. And it's a sadness, enormous sadness to be away from Dartmouth and my friends here, but it is a pleasure to be with my daughter and my grandchildren. And my daughter just has her second book uh, accepted by Paul Grave in England, and which is about uh, literature in the 19th century, North, South, the United States, Mexico, and Brazil. Okay, so we'll do four questions. So does somebody else have a have another one? I, I can't see, but we have a mic, so, okay. All right, while you're thinking, uh, I'm gonna ask a question, and that is, uh, you, the or I had 34, so anyway. So the origins of your uh, coming to the United States, okay. and uh, you know, that, that history, it's, it's fascinating, and just share that. I am a Spaniard. I was born in the province of Navarra in Spain, which is in the north. I was born in Pamplona, which is that crazy city where every 7th of July, men go on the streets and think that they're going to beat the, the, beat the, the bulls that run in the streets of my, my hometown. Um, my, I come from a family, my father was a teacher and he was Inspector General of Education of Navarra. Um, he, when the Civil War began, he had to leave Spain in a hurry because he was a Republican and he was a, uh, 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 um, a man who believed in um, freedom and democracy. Um, and he had to go into exile. Since they couldn't catch him, they came to my, our house and got my mother, my brother, my sister, and I, and put us in jail. I was two years old. I was born in 34. The Spanish Civil War began in 36. I spent three months in jail until we were exchanged for fascist prisoners, uh, and, and we went to Bilbao. You know that in the north of Spain, the bombings were, began very horribly. Guernica was painted because of the, of the bombings of the Basque region. Um, and and, and uh, while the bombings take, took place, the president of the Basque government began to evacuate children. Some of them went to England, some went to France, some went to Sweden, some went to uh, 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 Mexico, some went to Chile, and the last batch went to the Soviet Union. My sister, who was eight years old, was put in the last boat that left, and she ended up at eight being transported to the Soviet Union, which uh, was all right as long as she was gonna be back because my father told my mother, don't worry, the war is gonna end in six months. Six months later, of course, the Spanish Civil War had not ended. That was, this was 37. Uh, and in fact, in 39, the Second World War began. We left Spain, my mother, my brother, and I, with, after, after Bilbao fell, and we went to France. My sister, was not reunited with us for 10 years because, because of the war, the Second World War. We spent the Second World War in France under Nazi occupation. Um, we were reunited with my father. Uh, um, I learned French. That was a plus of that experience. Um, and um, we waited for my sister, and she was recuperated for us. She was found and brought back, brought back to, brought to France in 1948 by the Basque government in exile. Franco seemed to live eternally, so therefore there was no way to go back to Spain after, uh, uh, after my sister came. Uh, we went to South America where my mother had two sisters. 
uh, who had lived there for a long time. And I came uh, to the United States because I got the largest quantity of, of, of AIDS in high school in Uruguay. And they, they, I was offered a, a, a scholarship to come to the United States. I did, and I went back. But then I got married with a gringo, with an American, and I came back to the United States and uh, 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 I, 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 to live in New York. Um, and I went to Columbia University to continue my studies of history, which I had begun in Uruguay. And uh, then I had a child. Then all hell will be, uh, broke loose in the United States. People were smoking uh, uh, all sorts of things. People were uh, uh, going, uh, 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 ad having adventures. Uh, and those who did not want to do that kind of life, well, stayed home and went on living. I was one of those. And so I stayed with my child. And I went to Colombia. I continued to go to Colombia and to NYU. And then I came to Dartmouth. Life was very simple after that. <laughs> and it's amazing that it should have been so complicated before. But I think that all those complications have a great deal to do with the kind of person I am and, and, uh, and the kind of, uh, I wasn't afraid of anything because my father wasn't afraid of anything because my father, my, because we, I, I saw Germans and, 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 and dogs in the streets of Bayonne every day and they threw the, germ, the, the, the dogs to us and I learned how to escape them and there were no dogs in Hanover except just wonderful gentle dogs who sat in my classroom but not the kind of German shepherds that came after the people. So life was very different here. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you very much. <laughs>